This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So everyone, I want to introduce to you Bar Barbara Laria, who is chairing this next session, who is my accomplice in many things, including um, helping run Coast for all these years. She moved across the Bay to Berkeley, and she's still helping run Coast and join us with UC Berkeley, and um, couldn't ask for a better colleague. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. OK, um, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming back. <laughs> I'm really excited um, about this next session in the afternoon where we're hopefully going to get some good information about interventions and thinking through what we can really do about some of the issues that we face. And so I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit very briefly about what interventions, um, can interventions help? And I'm going to start by saying, yesterday I was talking to Barbara Abrams, and I was telling her about um, what I wanted to say and how I was going to cram everything in in 10 minutes. And as I'm outlining the talk, she's like, oh, did you see the opinion um, piece in the New York Times on Sunday? And I said, no, I hadn't at that point. Um, but uh, David Ludwig and Mark Friedman wrote a nice little piece that accompanies uh, a JAMA opinion piece. And it really outlines kind of what I wanted to talk about and the notion that maybe the first law of thermodynamics and that is, you know, energy in is equals energy out and um, is the focus and the driver of the obesity epidemic isn't the right way to think about it. And it's actually exactly what many people in the room here, including Rob Lustig and our group, have been challenged with and been thinking about. So how can we think about the obesity epidemic in a different way? And they go on, Ludwig and Friedman go on to say that, you know, what we're eating is really setting up um, fat storage so that the high carbohydrate content of our diets are really causing um, a different processing of our food. So the machine that is our bodies are taking in this fuel that is signaling store energy. And so we're really, we're really up against a mountain to try to think that we're going to um, have this equilibrium between energy in and energy out. And not only um, is the energy, dic uh, the energy that we're eating, these refined carbohydrates, dictating um, to store energy, but it's actually differentiated uh, based on the condition. And we've heard a little bit about that. So that uh, under conditions of stress, we might store fat in a different way. And we see from animal and human studies that that energy stored immediately is kind of visceral fat, that toxic fat. So it's really rethinking, and it's not for us necessarily in the room here, but how can we do away with the focus on calories and really focus on diet quality? It's all about the diet quality with, you know, when we're thinking about the diet, not the energy. So uh, a shift in focus from calories to diet quality must be the center point and, uh, of our message, and it must be the foundation of our nutrient nutrition interventions. So, can interventions work? Ludwig goes on to say that what we really need to do in interventions and his call for intervention studies is, quote, to provide participants with at least some of their food to make it easier for them to stick to their diets. <laughs> so that's even a bigger challenge. Um, and one reason to do this is because it's really, really challenging to uh, really have, be organized and be vigilant in this hypercaloric, refined carbohydrate environment to stick to these diets. And it's not that, um, not only that we have cues in the environment saying, eat me, eat me, you know, these refined carbohydrates, it's that our time constraint and stress are also saying, you gotta grab what's available. And what's available are the refined carbohydrates. 
So how can we make sure that we're gonna have three meals a day that are high nutrient dense meals? Another important consideration about maybe providing um, some of our study participants food is because of the sheer cost of eating a high uh, quality diet. And what we're really uh, interested in in our research is to help women, pregnant women who are low income and often food insecure, eat a healthy diet, and it's almost impossible. Okay, so how can interventions help during pregnancy? Well, as we already heard from Barbara and Suzanne will be talking about a little bit, the intervention studies that are out there are widely disparate in their findings. And there's just as many that are saying that the intervention did not find an effect as there are that found an effect. And when there is an effect, it's often among the normal weight um, women. So women who were normal weight entering pregnancy, they end up getting the effect of the intervention. And absolutely we want to target them, but we also want to target uh, women who are overweight and obese. And there is some suggestion in the literature that the more intensive the intervention is, then there's some effect. So we're talking about very intensive interventions. So diets um, is usually the um, primary target, but we're up against some grand challenges. And th here are three. Pregnant women eat very poorly. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Dieting is bad. Well, we don't want women to diet during pregnancy, but they're, they've usually come from um, a history of dieting and having dietary restraint and struggling with their weight. So dietary restraint and dieting and this kind of eating behavior um, sets them up during pregnancy, which is a time where you're supposed to eat and gain, gain weight. And there's a high percentage because of this of women who have disordered eating or non-homeostatic eating. And I'll just talk briefly. So just very, very, very briefly, um, we have a paper under review just simply showing diet quality of, among pregnant women. So we've parsed out women who are above 300% of the poverty level, so you know wealthier women on the left, and their score that you can barely see is a 57 of 100 on the healthy eating index. So 57 of 100, the healthy eating index is a is an index that's basically measuring adherence to the dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines are supposed to be a very you know, general way that we can measure how people are eating, and everyone should be able to uh, obtain five fruits and vegetables a day and eat them and have uh, whole grains, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not really a, har a high bar, but we're basically failing. And we see that um, you know, the next gradient, so women between 200 and 300% of poverty, they score 52. Um, as do women between 100 and 200%, and then women below the poverty level uh, score a 51. So let's see. Uh, so women above the 300% of poverty get an F, you know. And women who are below poverty get an F minus. But you know, when everyone's getting an F, does an F minus really matter? <laughs> You know, so, uh, you know, and even, uh, we, I just like to get people up to a C, but the thought of getting women from a 57 to a 70 is just mind boggling. And we see the same pattern, whether we're looking at N. Haynes and adult population, child population, or in other data sets. We are eating very, very poorly. I mean, an F, I can't, ah, I can't express this enough. Okay, so, uh, the typical diet is 70% refined uh, foods and only 30% whole foods, 70%. We need to flip this and make it 70% of the diet that are whole foods, whole fruits and vegetables, lean meats, and you know, um, whole grains. So that's the goal, and I'm not sure how we're gonna get there. And we also need to address eating behaviors. And we've heard a little bit about this, but we have just a preponderance of women who have non-pathological eating disorders. So just not, we're not, you know, there's women who have anorexia and bulimia and binge eating disorder, absolutely, but we also have uh, emotional eating, stress eating, um, and compulsive overeating. We have mindless eating, and we can't 
address this with dieting. So somehow we have to move women and over to eating with awareness and exercising some kind of cognitive restraint. There, we just have to. We've tried to think that somehow if we just um, tell them what they need to eat, they can over their circuitry can override all the cues in the environment and their time constraints, but it's not true. So how are we gonna deliver the intervention, the nutrition that women need, with awareness, reducing stress, and uh, improving cognitive restraint? That's what we're up against. So intervention components really need to focus on diet quality as the pinnacle, eating behaviors and address uh, eating patterns and how women eat, and they absolutely need to address stress, sleep, and physical activity, because these are the conditions under which we're gonna see differential effects of that fat storage. If we continue to focus on carbohydrate, or just energy, and not really focus on refined carbohydrates, we're gonna see weight gain. If we don't address the rest of it, we're gonna see differential weight gain in the most toxic areas, uh, you know, in the areas that create the most toxic fat. And I'm ending there with this, that horrible challenge, um, but that's my little overview.